Hello and welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional time. This is for Saturday, August the 24th, 2024. Thank you for joining me. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, before we get too far into this, hit the subscribe bar and then the notification bell when it comes up so you'll be notified whenever content is added to the channel. And remember to comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos. You know what to do. Uh, obviously, I'm not back in the office. I'm still traveling. I am enjoying some nice Middle Tennessee weather. It is going to be a scorcher today. I think we're going to be up over 90, which is fine with me. I like the heat. Yeah, I'm cool with it. Wait, what? Anyway, uh, so I'm outside here, and I've got the sun is rising in the east, and that's why I've got this shadow on one side of my face, because if I, the only way I can eliminate it is to turn directly into the sun, and then I can't see my monitors or anything, and I'm doing a good job to see my laptop monitor in front of me right now. Uh, so we'll make do with what we've got, and if I can find my mouse, we will go ahead and get started with our reading in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse uh, 41 and there it should be on the screen and so so Jesus now remember uh, he's got Peter's curiosity up here he's been talking uh, about those to uh, who need to be ready he has, uh, seems to imply that there would be some not ready. And of course, the disciples and the followers of Christ uh, should be ready. But Peter's maybe wondering, uh, okay, is this, uh, are there going to be some Christ followers, some Christians, some people who are disciples who won't be ready? Uh, it seems to be the, the curious part here that, that he's wondering. So in verse 41, he says, uh, Peter says, Lord, do you speak this parable to only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he does, uh, is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Then the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given and from uh, whom much will be required, to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you, uh, I tell you not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father. A mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And we'll dispense with any mother-in-law-in-law jokes uh, here for right now. Uh, so Jesus, uh, you know, he, did, he is the Prince of Peace. So how does, how, how's all this supposed to work with the division part? Well, th there's going to be division in the sense not everybody's going to become a Christian. And some people are going to be downright hostile towards Christianity. We see that throughout the years, various wars, places where Christianity is outlawed, uh, where the, in a lot of cases the religion of atheism is, is state-imposed, like in North Korea and Cuba and places like that. Uh, they're afraid of Christianity, and that's why they want to get rid of it. And so Jesus brings this kind of a division. Now, it'd be nice if everyone was a Christian, but remember, Jesus didn't convert everybody. Paul didn't convert everybody. We're not going to convert everybody, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't stop trying. And remember, Christianity is an intellectual exercise. You have to think. You've got to uh, think things through. You can't just accept it blindly. There's no such thing as blind faith when it comes to Christianity. Uh, Jesus, remember, we're to teach people which teaching requires intellectual exercises. It requires you to think. It requires you to ask questions. 
And so uh, with this division in the world, people are not going to accept the teachings. Peter, remember, said to have an answer for people who ask you a reason for the hope that is in you, but he never said that they would accept it. So we just go about and we just do the job we have. So verse 54, then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot, wa hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how do you not discern the times? And the, you may have a heading there that said, like uh, here on the screen, it says, make peace with the adversary. Pretend that's not there, because this is really tied together. He says, yes, and why even uh, of yourselves do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there until you have paid the very last might. So let's go back over here to the PowerPoint for just a minute. And let's see if we can break some of this down. Now let's go back to what he has to say about fire. Uh, because fire was uh, typically symbolic of judgment in the Jewish mind. So then the Jews typically regarded the coming of the Messiah's kingdom as a time of judgment. And they, they believed that God would judge the other nations with one standard and the Jewish people with a different standard. Uh, and the very fact that they were Jewish, they thought would be enough. They were God's people under the old covenant, and that would be enough uh, to get them across the finish line. Now, there are a lot of people who want to eliminate this whole idea of judgment, that God's not going to judge, that he's going to save everybody somehow. But regardless of what you think or believe, that does not negate what the scriptures say. Uh, judgment is going to come. Uh, Jesus taught that, it would, that there would be a judgment. And one day we will all be standing before the Lord to give account for what we've done with our time here. And then Jesus is saying he has a terrible experience he's going to have to pass through. He's got a life uh, full of tension, uh, and he's going to be passing through to uh, a very bad time before an ultimate triumph, and that being, of course, the crucifixion that's coming up when he goes to the cross. The idea here uh, is, uh, metaphorically, he'll be submerged uh, in that. He will go to the cross and suffer a great deal to pay the price for our sins. And this is what you have got to understand. The atonement is a biblical doctrine. This is one of the salvation issues that if someone rejects it, they're rejecting God. I, I think these people who call themselves Christians and reject the atonement are basically spitting in God's face. No, God, I don't want your atonement. I don't want your price paid for my sins. I'm rejecting it. Uh, you, you're going to regret that one day. That's all there is to it. Because that is going to be the only way in is to have the blood of Jesus uh, on your sins. And I'm going to come back to that here in just a moment. I'll have more to say about that. And Jesus, when he said, I have, uh, this is Matthew's wording of it. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have not come to bring peace, but division, Luke says. But it's the same concept with people rejecting Jesus and not wanting to uh, uh, follow Christ. That's going to create division. You see it already uh, in the four gospel accounts during his lifetime, there were people who, you know, Pharisees, scribes, and, and Sadducees, uh, particularly, who were working against him. And then right away, day one of the church, 3,000 people, yeah, were baptized, but how many weren't baptized? You ever think about that? And then as you go on through Acts, you see that there is a lot of kickback and pushback against the Lord's church as it's starting out. That's where the division comes in. You can have the peace of Christ by being a Christian. And peace, remember, is not just the absence of conflict. We think we'll have peace in the Middle East if we can just uh, straighten things out here with this war that Hamas started. Uh, but that won't bring peace. Most people hate each other and have for centuries. So that just signing some pieces of paper and giving some land or doing this or doing that is not going to bring peace. Without Jesus, nobody's going to have a full peace. And then beginning in verse 54, to the Jews, the Messiah has not yet come. And even today, the religious Jews don't believe that the Messiah has come. They're still looking. The uh, rabbi told me when you can see this minister and rabbi's conversation on my YouTube channel, uh, people, uh, Jews uh, now are still looking for the Messiah. How will they know the Messiah has come? Well, 
they'll just know it when they see it. Kind of like when uh, Justice or Associate Justice Potter Stewart said, I can't define obscenity, but I know it when I see it. They can't really tell you who the Messiah is, who he, she, they, it uh, will be, but they just will somehow know. <clears throat> But see here, what Jesus is getting at, his whole point is people will discern the weather, the physical things around us. Weather today is pretty nice here. A few clouds out, it's going to get hot, no rain in the forecast. So uh, it's going to be a day you might want to stay in the air conditioning, or if you uh, have to go outside, uh, take proper precautions. We can see that. That's physical. But people fail to discern the times, of such as the coming of the Messiah, when the Messiah is going to be here. Uh, and he's come, he's gone, he's coming back. And people fail to discern the spiritual matters. Uh, people who reject Jesus are not discerning who he is or what he's all about. And when it comes to our spiritual matters, that's going to be how we get to, to the ultimate goal of a heavenly home. And there, here they've got Jesus with them, and they're still not getting it. And, of course, people today uh, don't get it. And, and um, that will be uh, the determining factor when we stand before God whether or not we have uh, put our trust in Christ, we've been baptized into Christ, added to the Lord's church. You don't join the church. You can't do that, but you are added uh, to the church. And then Jesus speaks of their need to repent, the last uh, couple of verses there, basing this analogy on courts of law. There is a need to repent. Repent means to turn. You're going to turn around. You're moving away from God, and then you're going to turn around and come back and be reconciled to God. That's what repentance is. And it's not just saying, I'm sorry. It means you've got to change your life. And everybody who becomes a Christian, there are changes they need to make. It may be as simple as cleaning up your language. It may be something as you're in an occupation that needs to change in order to make a living and in order to serve the Lord. And this is, by the way, from Mark Black's uh, NIV commentary and the College Press uh, NIV series. Uh, and he goes on to say that while there is time that he or she should try hard to be reconciled in order to stay out of prison until every penny is paid, uh, Jesus is encouraging the crowd to observe the spiritual signs and to repent while there's still time before they get pulled into that eternal court. And that is the court of God where there is no appeal. And there's only one attorney admitted to the bar, and that is Jesus. Now, this is from the uh, Preacher's Outline and Sermon Bible. A misconception is that men have no need to make peace with God. Uh, there was a American writer, and I forget who it was, who died uh, near, like in the early 1900s. I, I just remember this from a literature class in high school. And on his deathbed, he was asked, have you made your peace with God? And to which he replied, I've never quarreled with him. Okay, uh, how many of us can honestly say we've never quarreled with God? I'd like to say that, but... <laughs> Uh, God and I have had our, our disputes. Let's just put it that way. And so here's some truths we need to understand is when we are before God or on our way. Number one, we have a bad case before God. We're guilty. We are guilty of sin. We are all bound for hell. We did not deserve uh, Jesus to come and pay the price for our sins. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much God loved you was to send Jesus. He didn't say, okay, humans, get it together and then I'll save you. Which, if that were possible, then Jesus didn't need to come and atone for our sins. So obviously it wasn't possible. And when a man uh, has a hopeless case with his adversary, the best thing to do is reach an out-of-court settlement. When you know, and, and when I was a legal assistant, I had a couple of cases like this. One case in particular, I remember, where the we were defending on a personal injury case. And the attorney went and took some depositions, and he just was about halfway through it wondering, okay, what else is going to go wrong? Oh, wait, this is, can go wrong. Oh, yeah, that can go wrong. And basically, we were wondering how many millions they were going to want to settle. And that was not uh, punitive uh, pain and suffering damages. Those were actual damages that a uh, client, uh, the, the, uh, the injured party, let's just say, uh, in, incurred. So uh, you want to get an out-of-court settlement before you get before a jury who decides you should have settled this out-of-court, so we're going to nail you. And so settle with God now, out-of-court. You know, Make your peace with God now. 
If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. You need to, by faith, obey what God has told us, repent of your sins, change your life, be immersed, be baptized, have your sins forgiven, not water sprinkled on you, but immersion. That's what the word means. And then uh, otherwise you're going to be judged and you're going to have to pay every penny. Let me tell you, you do not have enough money to pay that debt. You do not have the money that would be required to pay for your sins. Donald Trump doesn't have it. He could pull his resources with Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, throw in any other wealthy man you want or woman, and there's not enough there to pay the price for our sins with God. Anybody who denies the atonement or just says it's all good, God's going to save us all, you don't understand the holiness of God. You are bringing God down and Jesus down to being just another man. Jesus is just another man and God is just another God among gods created by humans. False doctrine, and you need to get away from that as fast as you can. Get to the truth, the biblical truth of who God is and who Jesus is. So that's going to wrap it up for today. We'll go to God in prayer as we usually do for Saturdays. We'll pray for uh, the fatherless. We'll pray for the jobless, the downtrodden. And then we'll also pray for our Sunday assembly. So uh, let's all pray together. We thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for all the things that you have provided us. We pray, Lord, especially now for those who are jobless. We've lost a lot of jobs in my community in the last six or seven months. And we want to pray for those people to be able to find employment, that they can hopefully stay in the area and not have to relocate, but they can do what's the least disruptive for their families. And pray for those who are in prison to find the Lord and be able to be productive when they come out and be able to have a true change of life. And for the women, Lord, who uh, are, are struggling with uh, uh, homelessness, and well, everybody who's struggling with homelessness, we want to lift them up. Women, Lord, who uh, are trying to raise children as single mothers, we pray for them. We pray, Lord, for men to step up and take their responsibility seriously. We pray that they will uh, see that uh, the spiritual and leadership that men need to provide. We pray, Lord, for the fatherless, that you'll help men to come into their lives to guide them to be the role model that they need. And for Sunday, we want to pray for the assemblies everywhere, for good attendance, pray for the truth to be proclaimed, and for us to all learn. For those that are uh, going out to, in evangelism uh, with door, the National Door Knocking Day coming up and back to church Sunday, we just pray for those efforts, Lord, to go smooth. We pray for those efforts to be fruitful. We pray, Lord, for souls to be one. We pray, Lord, for forgiveness of our sins. Help us to walk in your light always. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's it for today. And uh, the next time you see me, I'll be back in the office with the usual setting behind me. And uh, we'll continue on with uh, our study of Luke. If you have any questions, you can send them to me or you can leave them in the comment section below along with your comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say about all this. Thank you for being here. That's going to wrap it up for today. And yeah, I know it's a hot day, but you know what? It's still coffee time. See you in the next video.